Yeah, Ed and I have been doing this class for uh, for well, several years now uh, across the United States. We've we've done a lot of uh, a lot of work out here in the West, uh, as far back east as uh, what um, probably Des Moines and St. Louis and like that. And uh, it, it's it's a pretty good class, and, and we like to you know step up and and ask people you know where you know they get their experience from, how much experience they have you know, introduce themselves, that kind of thing. And like Julie was saying, it's probably going to run a little shorter than six hours because I always ask for a lot of questions. I ask a lot of questions of my classes, wow. you know, to make them, make them think. And so, you know, um, just a little bit about myself, though. Uh, I am, uh, live in uh, Salem, Oregon. Uh, I'm the Northwest Senior Accounts Manager um, for Emerson. Uh, this is one of the favorite things I do is, uh, you know, do training for different classes and, and uh, around my territory. Um, I've been in the industry since 1977, so, you know, that's uh, a few years, uh, getting close to 40-some years. And I've been with Emerson since 1994, uh, starting with Alco Controls and, and uh, worked my way up through uh, uh, to be with Copeland and, and – now I'm uh, their, their senior account manager up in the Northwest. So we're here to talk about refrigeration. And not knowing how many different people we have out there, what kind of level of experience we have, we're going to be very basic. And start out with, uh, with the refrigeration cycle itself, talk about the refrigerants. Uh, we'll go through, uh, you know, what's going on with new refrigerants, uh, what's going on with global warming potential, um, and then do a walk around the refrigeration system itself. So, <clears throat> the refrigeration cycle itself is, oh, let's see. We could go, this thing will work. Come on. And get this thing to change. Julie, I'm going to need some help, I think. Yeah, why don't you just try to hit your space bar? Uh, that doesn't, doesn't do anything. Yeah, you got okay, it. can you right, right click on your, um, right click and, and see if you have advanced or maybe take yourself off of annotate? What do you do? We got customers. I just, um, uh, Kevin, I just requested to take control, so. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Seems to be working oh. for you. Yep, that's fine. I'll, uh, I think it could be because we have quite a few people on. So there you go. You're okay. advanced to the next slide. All right. Well, this is refrigeration and air conditioning all in one. Uh, if you take a look at this, uh, basically this guy's done a great job of duct tape work. I, I have to, you know, applaud this guy. Went down to, to uh, Target and got himself a, a nice uh, a box fan, and he used the box as a plenum to pull the refrigeration out of his freezer and blow it on him. He's sitting up here in the corner someplace. And uh, he's, uh, you know, using it for air conditioning. Now, there's a problem with this picture. If you look at this, look at the, the uh, plenum that he's made with his, his freezer, he doesn't have any barometric relief, so he can't really pull any air in to let air be pulled out. So, you know, we try, <laughs> one thing I try to point out to people is, you know, things that are not so obvious. But yeah, you can see up on top there, he's probably got a cat, you know, he's got all these hairbrushes and stuff like that. So, you know, and, uh, you know, a bottle of vodka. So everything's going good there. Um, another one I was working with. Uh, Always I doesn't work. 
working with a 10-ton unit sitting on the roof, and the 10-ton unit fails, and the guy says, well, I can stage in two fives on that. You know, so that's, that's pretty good. Again, great yeah, use of that tape. Extraordinarily yeah. helpful on all of these situations. Really what, we're, well. what we're working on is... So when we talk about refrigeration, refrigeration itself is just taking heat energy from a place that we don't want it and taking it someplace and getting rid of it. So, you know, what we're doing is we're taking product and putting it in a box and making that box cold and making that product cold. Isn't that right? Not really right. What we're doing is we're putting product into a space where the heat is leaving the product and going into the air. And the air is going up to a, a, an evaporator coil of some sort and picking up the BTUs, the heat energy that comes out of that refrigeration and uh, taking it outside and getting rid of it. So when we look at the life of a pound of water, the definition of a, of a BTU is the amount of energy it takes to raise one pound of water one degree, correct? So when we look at, look at this, from zero degrees, from zero degrees to 16 degrees to 32 degrees, it takes about 16 BTUs or basically a half a BTU per degree to change the temperature of that ice. Then we have a latent heat exchange, a change of state where we don't have a difference in sensible heat, which there's two kinds of heat, latent heat and sensible heat. This is a latent heat exchange. In other words, we're picking up getting from 32 degrees ice to 32 degrees water, 144 BTUs for that pound of water, of ice, to turn into all water. Then the water's at 32 degrees, and it starts to raise in temperature in sensible heat, something we can sense with a thermometer. And when it, from 32 degrees water to 212 degrees water, that takes about 180 BTUs. Then we get to another latent heat exchange. This is vaporization. Taking this pound of water and turning it into steam takes 970 BTUs. That's what refrigeration uses, is that latent heat exchange between the vaporization and the condensation of that liquid refrigerant that's in the pipes. So, you know, that was an epiphany I had a few years back you know, when I looked at it and I go, well, what's really making this work? And someone talked to me about latent heat. And I go, oh, there's the reason. That's why there's so many BTUs per pound in refrigerant that it makes it a perfect vehicle to take those BTUs from where we don't want them and get rid of them. So if we look at the, at the family of refrigerants, this is just some of the refrigerants. I, you wholesalers out there, you know there's <laughs> how, do you, how do you have a warehouse full of this stuff and not have the right one, you know? But if you look on the left-hand side, R12 and then R502 and then R22, we're back when I started, 1977, that's the only refrigerants we had, 12, 22, and 502. Then you had something called the ozone depletion factor, chlorine and molecules that the R12 had. And they, they pulled R12 and 502 off the market immediately, but they left R22 in, R22 being H HCFC. But the CFCs, R12 and 502, went away and they were replaced by these other refrigerants, like 409, uh, 401, 134A, those kind of things. And then R502 had its replacements, 408, 404, you know, 402A, 507. Then R22 had a replacement or has a replacement of 407C and then 410A, which is now, high pressure. Now it's on my headset. So, you know, 410A is, is a lot higher pressure, but it, it has other problems as well. If you look at if you look at this chart here, this shows you R404A at the top, 
has global warming potential and CO2 at the bottom. CO2 is the baseline. One pound of CO2 effect on the atmosphere is the same as one global warming potential at, on this chart. So if, if you take that and carry that up through, you could see R22 there at 1810. What that means is for every pound of R22 that's released, it does 1810 pounds of damage to the atmosphere. So we go on down the line, there's 410A at 2088. So it's got a higher, higher GWP or global warming potential than R22, but yet it's still being used for air, air conditioning and it's not being, not being uh, taken off the, off the market. The one that, uh, that really gets us is 404A at the top. Remember, that's a 502 replacement, and the supermarkets went to R22, then they went to R404A, and now you're looking at a gas that has got a really, really high global warming potential. It has 3,922 GWP. In other words, for every pound of 404A that's released the atmosphere, that does 3,922 BTUs of, of uh, effect, or pounds of effect. Now, I've been lost here. There we go, back again. So we evaluate these refrigerants, talking about the 410A and the R22, we evaluate hey, those. Kevin, a, a, Kevin yeah. I'm not sure that you're sharing your screen anymore. When you when you dropped off, I think you lost. Something dropped. So just go back to share share content. Okay, got it. Got it. And right there. There you go. Thanks for getting me through this. No problem. And then just take it back to full screen if you would. All right. Seems to be working now, except for getting back to the slideshow. There we go. So, okay, sorry for that, guys. Um, the total earth warming index that we're looking at, or total earth warming impact, is two things, direct global warming from refrigerant leakage, just like that 404A or R22 or which, whatever it is, the amount of pounds of CO2 effect that's done per pound that's released is, is taken into consideration. Then the next thing is indirect global warming. Indirect is the energy consumption. Basically, how efficient is this compressor at moving these BTUs from the inside to the outside? And, you know, that energy consumption, that amp draw, those kilo kilowatts that's being used is part of the indirect global warming. So you add those two together and they make a total earth warming index. Um, now, this is why 410A is still available and R22 is being taken off the market, is because of this, the TEWI that the uh, 410A has is better because it's a more efficient refrigerant. It has, uh, you have no problem with uh, the energy consumption. So here we've got a chart that kind of shows what's going on for the, for the immediate future. And, uh, you know, we're talking about refrigerants that are out here like uh, 404A and 507 that are sitting out here at 3,922 GWP. That's way off the screen. If you're looking at a, at a computer screen, that, that green bar that's out there should be another six inches out the other side of the screen. Um, you know, you look at R22. Now, this got 407A, 407C, and 407F, but it's still sitting up here higher than we want to see as far as GWP level is concerned. 410A is pretty high as well. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get down to this line of 750 GWP and less. And that's just a, just a baby step. What we're doing with 448 and 449, those of you who have used it already, 
is replacing 404A and 507 with 448 and 449, but it's just getting us to the 1500 GWP level. We need to be below that 750. So there's other refrigerants. If you follow the same line across to the left, where you can see NH3, NH3 is what, what's that? Ammonia, right? Um, then we've got uh, the next one is less than 150 GWP, and the next one is about 300 GWP at R444B. Um, you know, all of these are, are blends that, if you look above in the chart, A2L is mildly flammable. They have a flammable component. So, you know, when we look at those, uh, we have to make sure that, you know, they're, they're meeting with local codes, national codes, and that kind of thing. Uh, and in the middle of that, all that mix, you've got R290, which is butane, um, propane, or whatever you want to call it. That's A3. It's flammable. Um, and, uh, you know, limited to the amount of refrigerant that you can actually put in the system. Um, now, if you look at 410A up at the top, top right-hand side of that chart, you see that its replacements are going to be over here at the R32 HFO blends. Again, a mildly flammable refrigerant. So, you know, we look at that and we go, well, we've got to go towards the flammable refrigerant to maintain that pressure and maintain that that. Uh, 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 efficiency of that refrigerant, the, its capability to carry BTUs from the inside to the outside and reject them. So, you know, that's that's where refrigeration comes in. So we've got basic components here. We talked about one already. That would be refrigerant. Then you've got a compressor. You've got a condenser. Condensers where you get rid of the BTUs, expansion device, like a thermal expansion valve, and an evaporator. The evaporator picks up the BTUs. So if you look at the right half of this chart as being the indoor part of the refrigeration system where it's in a walk-in box or something like that, um, you put product in there, the product gives off its BTUs to the air inside the box. Those BTUs travel up to the evaporator that has a fan that's blown across the coil, and it picks up those BTUs that are being expelled by the, the uh, product and puts them into the refrigerant. As it puts it into the refrigerant, it raises its pressure. It raises its temperature, increases the BTUs that go in there, and the evaporation process begins. It, uh, it starts to uh, turn into a vapor. That's the evaporator portion of it. Then it goes back to the compressor and up to the condenser. The condenser is where you get rid of the BTUs to some place you don't care, whether it's a air-cooled condenser, water-cooled condenser. There's a variety of different ways of getting rid of those BTUs. But uh, that's on the high side of the system. And then the expansion device is a metering device for the refrigerant that's coming from the condenser. We'll look at this a lot, a lot closer. So um, it uh, meters the amount of refrigerant evaporator in response to how many BTUs are being picked up by the evaporator. It senses the temperature and, and the pressure and, and adjusts itself to the proper amount of flow so that the evaporator doesn't get overfed or underfed refrigerant in order to carry that refrigerant back to, and those BTUs back to the compressor and up to the condenser. Now that being said, looking at this, this, these four components, um, in order to make heat energy move, you have to have a temperature difference. In other words, that evaporator, if we've got a 35 degree walk-in box, that evaporator's gotta be colder than that 35 degree air that's in that box. So, it, you know, it's, uh, it's gonna be someplace around 25 degrees as a design temperature. And it, they rarely are gonna be exactly 10 degrees temperature difference. But heat always flows downhill from a hot thing to a cold thing. 
they never you never put ice on something and make that thing cold the the warm thing gives up its heat to the ice and uh and so you know it's uh heat flowing downhill so on the in, indoor part of this thing you've got an evaporator that is uh picking up the heat taking it out to the condenser and getting rid of it the evaporator is 10 degrees td it's 10 degrees colder than the box temperature then when it gets outside that compressor raises the pressure and temperature of that condenser to the point that it has enough temperature enough td to reject the btus from the evaporator in a lot of cases that's 20 degrees over the ambient so and for instance if you've got a 70 degree ambient if it's 70 degrees outside a condenser is going to be someplace around 90 degrees it'll be a 20 degree td or temperature difference and then at that point that condenser is making liquid refrigerant out of that that uh, that refrigerant that's being fed to it because as the btus come out of the refrigerant it turns into a liquid and that liquid is what is fed to the expansion device so um let's talk about a little bit about btus what's a ton of refrigerating effect well a ton of refrigerating effect is 12,000 btus or the basically the same amount of, of heat that it takes to melt one ton of ice in one day that's 288,000 BTUs per day you divide that by 24 you come up with 12,000 BTUs per hour and that's that's a ton of refrigerating effect so how much is a BTU again it's it's basically how much energy it takes to raise one pound of water one degree and that's roughly about the same amount as if you struck a match and, and let that match burn all the way up that's about exactly what what you have to have to be one btu so you know you got tons of refrigerating effect in air conditioning that's straight up 12,000 btus uh, refrigeration same thing tons ton 12,000 btus different compressors pump different rates at different evaporator temperatures but we'll not get into that right now um, okay so if we look at those four components and the fifth component was refrigerant the sixth component that we're looking at is refrigerant piping when you look at the refrigerant piping you've got a big line and a little line uh, let's say three-eighths and seven-eighths the three-eighths line is the liquid line the seven eighths is the suction line the discharge line coming off the compressor is going to be a different size yet it could be five eighths it could be half inch feeding that condenser and it all has to do with velocities what kind of velocity you're going to have in the suction line what kind of velocity you're going to have in liquid line in feet per minute um, you're trying to move the same amount of refrigerant down the liquid line as there as it's coming back down the suction line and at the at a low pressure drop so you don't have an undue amount of change in pressure as it comes down the line the discharge line is going to be someplace in between if you think about if you think about the amount of molecules of refrigerant that are in the line in the suction line pressure is low low pressure means low temperature low temperature means low pressure it also means that the molecules are very far apart there there's not much pressure there it's just like putting air in a tire until you get enough air molecules in that tire it, it doesn't start getting inflated so suction line let's say they're a little ways apart when it goes into the compressor and it compresses it it squeezes those all together into the discharge line so the molecules are really close together but they can't turn into liquid until they reject the BTUs so that 5 8 line goes up to the condenser the condenser rejects the BTUs it turns into liquid when it turns into liquid the molecules are as close together as they possibly could in the liquid line so that's why a liquid line would be 3 8 line and suction line would be 7 8 or you know always smaller liquid line than it is suction line 
and it carries that liquid all the way up to the expansion device and uh, the cycle starts all over again. So those six things. Now, when a contractor's talking about high side and low side, he wants a high side control, uh, a head pressure control possibly, uh, a, a open on rise of pressure or close on rise of pressure. That'd be reverse acting head pressure control, but that's a high side control. If you want a high pressure control, normally you want something that's going to be a safety. So that's going to be a, a rise in pressure. It's going to open contact. Then on the other side of the coin, on the lower side, you've got lower pressure, lower temperature, and he wants a low side control, usually low pressure control like a pin P70 uh, or uh, uh, Ranco 010, 1402, something like that. That low pressure switch is going to be a uh, close on rise, open on fall type control. So it's going to be opposite of what the what the uh, head pressure control is. Or you could have dual pressure controls that have both the high side and the low side in the same control. So the low side of the system over where the evaporator is, is where you pick up the BTUs. And uh, the uh, high side of the system over on the condenser side is where you maintain that pressure. Now to, re to reject the BTUs, talking about maintaining pressure, if the condenser is always 20 degrees TD, always 20 degrees temperature difference between it and the ambient. As the ambient changes, it always maintains 20 degrees difference. Even though it's colder outside, when it gets down to 20 degrees, it's still going to be trying to maintain a 40 degree head pressure, you know, which is really, really low. Um, because all it's going to do, all it needs to do is reject the BTUs that, that's picked up by the evaporator. And if that requires 20 degrees TD, that's what it's going to do with the condenser. Um, so it follows the ambient. If it's 90 degrees out, the condensing is going to be 110. If it's 70 degrees out, it's going to be 90. If it's 50 degrees out, it's going to be 70. It's always doing that. And with that, the pressure and temperature changes. As the temperature changes, the pressure goes down. On the, on the high side, as it goes down, it gets further and further away from the, set, the uh, uh, design criteria that are used for the expansion device. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. But, you know, it, when your head pressure falls too far, you're going to lose uh, the amount of pressure that you have at the inlet of the expansion valve, and it, and it doesn't feed the evaporator correctly. So... So in the in those pipes, you've got three different states of refrigerant. Basically, to start out with, saturated refrigerant, saturated suction and discharge is what you read at the evaporator and the condenser on a refrigeration system. What you would expect if you have liquid and vapor in contact with each other in equilibrium. In other words, if you had like a a 25-pound jug of some kind of refrigerant, let's say R22, and you had it sitting in the in the uh, middle of the floor and it gets to 72 degrees, you could look at a PT chart, you could look at a temperature pressure chart for R22, and you could take the pressure of that, and it's going to be someplace around 125 mm -hmm. pounds. And that means that that is an equilibrium and it's in a saturated state. In other words, there's vapor and liquid together in contact that can boil off or condense as temperature rises and falls. So, you know, you can actually take the temperature of the room with a PT chart in a jug of refrigerant. So what we're looking at here, um, you know, pressure and temperature are tied together. Uh, if you take the sensible temperature of that line, sensible temperature being 128 degrees, and you take the pressure of the line at the same place being 287 pounds, you can convert that 287 pounds 
with a PT chart for R22 to 128 degrees. And the line temperature is 128 degrees. That proves that you have saturation at that point. That proves saturation. So again, you're going to find those at the evaporator and the condenser where you've got refrigerant boiling off or, or turning into a vapor or turning into a liquid. Um, it's picking up BTUs and, and staying the same pressure, just changing the uh, amount of BTUs that are going through there due to latent heat exchange. That latent heat that we're looking at in the vaporization of water, uh, same kind of thing, really high BTUs per pound. So the the uh, evaporator picks up the uh, picks up the heat, the condenser rejects the heat, and at those points you have liquid and vapor together that gives you saturation. Now superheat, super means above. Superheated refrigerants is any heat added to refrigerant vapor that makes its temperature rise above saturation point. So if you expected to read the, the thermometer at 54 degrees, if you read that thermometer and you expected your, your uh, pipe to be a certain pressure, it's going to be different. The line temperature is actually 54. If you take the pressure of the line at 75 pounds, the PT chart, it should be 44 if it were saturated. But it's not. It's above that. It has sensible heat gain up 10 degrees. So you've got 10 degrees of superheat. That's important. And at this point, you know, I, I normally ask people, why do you think that's important? And, you know, in essence, it's to keep our compressors alive. Uh, you know, if you don't have superheat, you've got liquid refrigerant coming back to a compressor, and compressors don't compress liquid very well. Ed's going to talk about that a little bit later. So um, superheat is very necessary as far as that's concerned, that, that gain in sensible heat, sensible heat being something that you can sense with the thermometer. That rise in, in sensible heat gives us superheat and saves our compressors. And you'll find it from the evaporator, the last few passes of the evaporator, all the way through the compressor to the condenser. Now, what happens with the suction line with that superheat, when it comes back to the compressor and it compresses it, what happens to that superheat? It's, it's <laughs> amplified, basically. From the low side to the high side, as it goes through there, you might have 10 degrees of superheat on the low side, but the high side of the discharge line is going to be 190 to 200 degrees. And a lot of that is just superheat above the ambient, okay, above what the saturation is of the condenser. So, you know, you've got your condenser has to be capable of getting rid of that superheat as well as change that refrigerant and get rid of the BTUs that are coming from the evaporator. That's why the condenser is 20 degrees TD or more, and the evaporator is 10 degrees TD, pretty much standard. BTUs that go into the evaporator come back through the suction line. They're amplified by the, by the discharge, and they come up to the condenser, and you have to reject that, all those BTUs and the superheat, in order to get that refrigerant to turn into a liquid. So on the other side of the coin, subcooling, sub, below, below saturation, the temperature below saturation. And you're going to find that subcooling on the high side of the system. Uh, in this case, um, we're looking at a thermometer that uh, gets sensible heat of 120 degrees line temperature, and we're taking the pressure at the same place, and we're finding 280 pounds per square inch on our gauge, uh, and we convert that with a PT chart to 125 degrees. So 125 degrees less 120 degrees line temperature is five degrees of subcooling. So now I would normally ask, you know, what's subcooling good for? And I'll just answer that for you. Subcooling is required 
at the outlet of the condenser to get refrigerant all the way to the expansion device without making it, letting it have any bubbles. Because there's all kinds of pressure drops that are involved in the liquid line. It's like a garden hose. If you've got 500 feet of garden hose and you try to fill a gallon bucket at the end and it takes two minutes to fill that gallon bucket because you've got 500 feet of garden hose, you can fill that, that uh, bucket in about 10 seconds if you only have 10 feet of hose. So, you know, there's a difference in the amount of pressure drop or restriction on the line that uh, you have to compensate for with subcooling. Subcooling cools the liquid below saturation so it doesn't reach saturation before it gets to the expansion valve. So let's see. Subcooling is going to be someplace between the condenser and the expansion device. There's another thing here that, uh, that should show subcooling in it and, is, and saturation as well. When you have an expansion valve, you should always have a receiver on the line. That receiver on the top skin of that, of that uh, liquid refrigerant that's laying in the receiver, it's in contact with what? Vapor, right? So when you are in contact with vapor, you have saturation. At least that's what we're told. Well, that's correct. But underneath that, underneath that skin where the refrigerant can boil off, and, uh, and give you that saturation, you can have subcooling as well. That's why the dip tube goes to the bottom of the receiver and picks the liquid up from down there because it's colder than the saturation point of the skin or the, the surface of the liquid that's in the receiver. So you've got both saturation and subcooling in a receiver. You don't lose your subcooling when you go through a receiver just because you're in contact with vapor. So, you know, that's, uh, that's between the condenser and the expansion device. So a subcooled liquid would be there. So the three conditions of the refrigerant. At this point, I usually have somebody explain them to me. But uh, the greens are saturation. The reds are all superheat. Blue is all subcooling. So this kind of shows the product with air moving around it, taking the BTUs, taking those BTUs that are being rejected from the product into the air to the evaporator where it's picked up and boiled off. The BTUs go into the refrigerant and carried through the compressor up to the condenser where they're rejected. Now, again, when we're talking about the condenser being a high temperature difference to the ambient, um, you know, there's several things that are involved with that. Not only the BTUs coming back with the, with the evaporator or from the evaporator, not only that heat of compression that makes the superheat rise, but also you've got the motor temperature. The motor temperature on a suction-cooled compressor like this one uh, you know, is carried through, since it's on the suction line side, it's cooled by the suction gas going across it. And those BTUs are rejected to the uh, refrigerant, and that has to be rejected by the condenser as well. So that's why the temperature of a condenser is always, temperature difference is always higher than what an evaporator is going to be. So that gets us to the dividing point again from the high side to the low side, high side being high temperature, reject, rejecting heat, low side being low temperature, picking up heat. Point. I'm going to call Mr. Seconds, and I'm going to have to get over to him somehow. Ed, are you on? Mm, and he probably is, but I need to unmute him again. There you go. Let's see. 
Well, I hope he's still on here. And Ed, are you there? I can see his screen. I can see his screen too. Hello? Is this Ed? Yes. Hello? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> is everyone there? Yeah, I think Hello? so. Okay. Ed, we have Ed, we have about fifteen minutes before we probably yeah, need to take take a take a break somewhere. So Yeah, I think we have fifteen uh just amount of time just to to uh transition to the break and stuff like that. So we're I think we're good. So yeah, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh again, my name is Ed Seffens. I'm located down in Southern California. Uh, I've been with the industry now since 1980, <clears throat> just by chance, actually, one of those things where someone recommended me to jump in the industry, and I've been here ever since, so it's been a good industry to be in, actually. So <clears throat> I've been, uh, past history, I've worked for previous companies that I worked for, was uh, Sporlin Refrigerating Specialties and, and uh, Hanson Technologies before coming over here. I was a contractor there for a while, did some service work and stuff. But um, I've been here now with uh, Copeland um, Emerson Climate for uh, 13 years. Just had my 13-year anniversary. So <clears throat> nice job, Kevin, um, by the way. So we're going to look at a little bit on, on compressors. And this uh, compressor here is what we call our K-body compressor. Or uh, well, another term would, we would use for it would be an air-cooled compressor. This is a semi-hermetic compressor. We manufacture semi-hermetic and hermetic style compressors. This is the semi-hermetic compressor. And what's the difference between the two is that this compressor here, you can pull the head. You can see, I don't know if you can see my um, my pointer up here, but you have bolts with the head. This is the head right here on top. And you can actually, the service technician can actually get in there and pull these pull these bolts out and, and um, <clears throat> review and take a look at what's going on down inside the the uh, cylinder walls and the pistons and take a look at the um <clears throat> the um the valve plate. Now this is uh what what differentiates this compressor as an air cool compressor to a refrigerant cool compressor is the fact that um if I were to take this compressor and lay it um and position it or orient it to the position where I, I just see the head and the front end of the compressor, both the suction and the discharge service valves are located on the, the head of the compressor. And just by looking at that compressor, it, you can say, oh, that's an air-cooled compressor. Well, one thing about air-cooled compressors is the fact that they fail different. They have, uh, um, if, if they do fail, that um, they have signs that, that, um, that you can look at to to note that it's a, um, like a liquid, a direct liquid slug into the head of the compressor would be a good indication um, of, of possible failure for this compressor and stuff like that. But aside from that, we're not talking comp uh, failures today. So, um, um, and by the way, our field technicians, we do give classes. Um, um, we uh, are available for classes at the store level and stuff. And when, some of the classes that are popular for me, and I know Kevin as well, is the uh, five most common failures of compressors and how to review them, which would be another teardown class that we um, that we give. And a lot of our field guys back east, everyone, um, we're very involved with these classes. So, but if we take a look at this compressor, we see the uh, the stator on the stator end of the compressor or the motor end of the compressor is pressed into the body of the compressor itself. The rotor then is attached to the uh, the crankshaft. The um, pistons are connected to the crankshaft via the uh, connecting rods and stuff. And these compressors uh, can uh, operate in both um, in both directions. Uh, there's they're bidirectional. They don't have to. You don't have to worry about um, any directions for these compressors themselves. And initially, when this compressor came out, it was a it was a low pressure type compressor. It worked with um, 
R12 back in the day. We had to make some adjustments um, back then for R22 uh, and 502 at that time, um, uh, the three mainstays, refrigerants in our industry at that time. But um, uh, you see these style of compressors, the K-body compressors, in um, a lot of low profile for profile condensing units that you would find like in a reach-in freezer, reach-in cooler box and stuff, and they're either sitting on top of the, of the box or, or, or down below. Okay, so this does have a, um, the, the older style compressors, when they first originally, they didn't need an oil pump, but now these do have an oil pump pretty much in the front end of the compressor itself, and we have a dip tube that reaches down into the sump of the compressor, and as the compressor is pumping or rotating, we actually pull up the oil and we can then lubricate some of the journals and hot spots that we need to, to keep lubricated so uh, the compressor would run and, and, um, and not have to worry about it seizing and stuff like that. So on this compressor itself, again, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but um, uh, you can repair these uh, by the valve plates. You can buy the valve plates. In fact, we always recommend that if, if you do come across one of these compressors and it has failed, if it's under warranty, go ahead and pull the head, take a look at your valve plate, <clears throat> take a look down at the side of the, the cylinder walls, see if there's any scarring at all or anything like that. Um, if it's a valve plate, then by all means, just replace the valve plate. The wholesalers should have that part number available and stuff, and or we can get that out to you if need be. And just replace the valve plate. It's not necessary to pull the whole compressor out and replace the entire compressor if you need to. Okay, so um, <clears throat> just a little bit of food of thought. Some other air, that, uh, some other air cool compressors that we have available would be the H, the E, uh, the three body, and the and the L uh, that you would take a look at. <clears throat> ah, I didn't know we had this in here. So here's the directional flow itself. So as the gas comes in through the suction side of the system, your velocity of the gas is anywhere from 500 to 700 feet per minute. Kevin talked about that earlier. And as the as we have these changes per se going. Uh, gas changes within um, the direction of flow itself, um, this pressure above the, and we're going in the downward stroke in this sense, this pressure right here um, has to be greater than the pressure here below the, um, the reed itself before the reed will actually open up and allow gas to enter into the, uh, the cylinder cavity. Um, but we're doing another thing here also is we're by the direction uh, uh, the gas directions and stuff is we're uh, hopefully we're pulling out the oil itself and dropping the oil in back into the crankcase out of the compressor. All right, and then the piston goes back in the upward stroke. Again, this this pressure right here has to be greater than the pressure right here before the um, discharge reed would open up and and um, be discharged out to the high side of the system. All right, this is the. Um, this is our uh, refrigerant cool compressor, and um, this will be one of our 9R compressors itself. It's a reed style compressor. By looking at the top, we have reed compressors, a reed and discus style compressors, right? So the way this compressor works, again, as the gas flows through the suction side of the system, <clears throat> we're going about 500 to 700 feet per minute, and that's per design, okay? As the gas then enters into the stator cover portion of the compressor or the motor um, compartment of the compressor itself, the gas then uh, goes in between the stator. This is the stator, and this is the rotor. Again, the rotor is attached to the connecting rod, or not connecting rod, the crankshaft. The gas then goes in between the stator and the rotor itself and sent back up to the head to be recompressed. Now, we're doing two things here, <clears throat> or actually, when the gas is coming in through the, um, uh, the suction side of the system, by the time it hits this, goes through the strainer here and stuff, and hits this wide portion of the uh, compartment itself, the velocity of the gas slows way down. It, it drops considerable. And what happens is the oil being heavier than the vapor itself drops and starts to pool and collect here for the oil to be sent through the the um, the, uh, the crank, uh, the check valve itself into the crank side of the of the compressor. Okay, but uh, uh, um, we're doing two things here with the gas. If there's any liquid refrigerant that's built or that's entrained in that vapor as it goes through the um, the stator and the rotor, hopefully we have enough heat generated by the stator 
uh, that it actually uh, boils that refrigerant out by, so that by the time it gets up into the head of the compressor, uh, we get nothing but vapor, all right? <clears throat> So, uh, and then here we have the uh, crank side, crank shaft side of the compressor itself. Here's where the oil dip, uh, we don't have a dip tube itself per se. We do have an oil strainer, which is replaceable. You can replace the, the strainer. The oil pump can be replaced with this compressor. The, um, the valve plate also can be replaced. Um, and also the motor protector itself can be replaced in this compressor. Everything else um, cannot be replaced. So we do have parts available for this compressor, especially if an oil pump fails. And uh, again, when we give these classes on compressors and stuff in the five most common failures of compressors, we identify how to, um, how to take a look at the oil pump and find out what is the proper uh, net oil pressure um, to be delivered back to the oil journeys, uh, journals and bearings and stuff like that for, uh, for lubrication and stuff. So again, this is our <clears throat> cool semi-hermetic compressor. And uh, some of the models that we have are some of the E's, the 3's, in um, the discus, all the discus style, 3D, 4D, 6D, 8D. By the way, if you have a compressor that's a 4D, uh, maybe a 4R, 6D, or 6R, those style compressors, if they fail out in the field and they bring them back to the, you bring them back to the, uh, the wholesale house, make sure you bring and include the contactor with that, especially if the compressor is under warranty, so that we can take a look at both the, um, the compressor and the contactor to determine, um, uh, and hopefully uh, um, it's not a single phase burn. That's what we're looking at. If it is a single phase burn, we need to have that contractor backed for warranty uh, credit, if that's possible. All right? And I think this is one of my last slides, so I'm going to try to get through this here real quick. We also have the scroll. Um, the scroll, this is a hermetic compressor. And notice you can't, there's no head bolts. There's nothing that you can remove from this compressor. And same with the CR, another um, <clears throat> smaller compressors. We have the AA-style compressor and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, some of the other uh, smaller pots that we, that we use for uh, smaller, uh, some of the smaller um, condensing units that we have. <clears throat> but this is the scroll. And uh, with the scroll itself, you take a look at the, um, the body of the scroll. The, the, the um, stator is actually pressed into the scroll shell itself. The scroll is then, um, uh, or the, the shaft is connected to the um, the rotor, the rotor then is attached to the what we call the orbiting scroll down at, the, at the, the, the bottom portion of the scroll, and then we have the fixed scroll up at the top up here. Um, one thing nice about the scroll, our scroll compressors, is pretty much the entire scroll itself, except for the top cap where we have the muffler plate on the top portion. This is all high pressure, and the, there's high pressure right here in the middle portion of the scroll, but this is all low pressure or suction pressure of the system, right? So um, your suction pressure gas comes in, again, velocity 500, 700 feet per minute. By the time it hits its wide spot, it's like, in a, like a mini accumulator almost, right? It, the, the gas uh, separates itself from the, um, from the oil, the oil being heavier. And, of course, our velocity in here or the, gas, or the flow itself is much lower than what you would have in the suction line. The oil tends to pull down at the bottom, get sent back up through the shaft to be recompressed or not recompressed, sorry, to be re uh, used as lubricant and stuff. Then the gas itself gets sent out through the discharge side of the system, all right? This is our CR. <clears throat> CR is a, um, one of our uh, piston or reciprocate, reciprocating compressors. And what differentiates this from the other, other than being a reciprocating uh, is the fact that um, you can see the discharge uh, line gets looped down at the bottom portion here. And, and what we're doing here is, is as the oil pools here at the bottom of the, of the sump of the compressor, um, you know, we're trying to, uh, trying to desuperate some of the gas going out to the, to the, um, uh, to the system. And, and all, um, another thing too with this compressor is the fact that it has springs that hold the motor to the body or the shell of the compressor itself. You can actually take this compressor and kind of bounce it up and down a little bit and you can hear the motor 
or the compressor itself uh, bang against the shell of the compressor. I don't advise that, but when you, if you have an older compressor and it's uh, deemed that it's failed or something like that, certainly do that with, uh, feel free to do that with that other compressor if you like. So uh, let's see, what else do we got here? Oh, this is, uh, this is our scroll um, in operation here. And what, uh, this is the orbiting scroll that's moving. And what we have up here is what we call the fixed scroll. Now we have uh, what we call the flanks of the scrolls. And then we have the tips. And uh, the flanks and the tips, when they match these scrolls back at the factory, the tolerances between the flanks and the tips is, is one ten thousandths of an inch. Uh, and that's how they mate or match these, uh, these uh, compressor parts together. Um, and then once they match them, then they, um, they send them out to the uh, other portion of the factory so that the entire scroll can be built from there. But, <clears throat> but um, where do I want to go with this? Let's see here. Here we're showing that um, the, the scroll, the top portion or the fixed scroll itself is being separated. And all it, all it takes is one millimeter of separation between the tips itself and we don't pump. So what happens is the gas then just flows down through the low side of the of the compressor, right? When we open that up. But this is showing um, one of our digital scrolls and how it modulates. And with the digital scroll, <clears throat> um, we came out with this. Gosh, what five years ago, something like that. It's, it's been a while now, and it's uh, you see them a lot in the Aeon units. Uh, Hill Phoenix uses them. And some of the refrigeration package units, they're widely used now in a lot of different manufacturers and stuff. And this is our smaller um, scroll um, body itself. And how I know that I think this one goes up to what seven horse, seven horsepower, seven and a half horsepower. The larger, the larger uh, compressors, if you identify it, the, the solenoid is actually built into the side of the compressor itself. Okay, so. The way this works is we have a solenoid valve here. When it's de-energized, when the um, when the when the compressor is de-energized, then what happens is we back up this pressure on the high side of the system, uh, or the high side of this portion of the of the tube itself, and that pushes pressure down on top of this of this piston that, that's riding in this little cylinder portion of the of the cylinder head, or the or the, the head itself of the of the uh, of the scroll. And that forces or pushes pressure down on top of the uh, the fixed scroll itself, and and so in that sense, what we're doing is we're we're actually pump we're pumping, um, sending a refrigerant out into the discharge side of the system. When we de-energize this uh, this valve, we relieve this pressure, this hold down force on top of this piston gets bled down into the suction side of the of the um, of the compressor itself. Right, and then we um, we actually no longer have that hold down force to keep the compressor from, or to keep the compressor pumping. And um, by uh, because we have that high pressure right here in the portion of the scroll, that actually forces the scroll apart, and we no longer uh, pump. So if we time average that out, um, uh, our uh, our controllers will sense it, uh, a time average. And since the either the suction pressure or the suction temperature, personally I prefer suction pressure because it's a little bit more exact and more uh, there's no delay or lag time on that uh, when it senses that. But then um, it it'll send suction pressure every 20 seconds, and, it's, and depending on what their suction pressure is, based on the load at the evaporator, and we didn't talk about load, uh, what load is, um, we will get there. Um, but the load or the heat that's produced by the product that's inside the evaporator itself, that would be your load itself. If we, if someone came in there or the uh, delivery personnel came in and uh, brought in a bunch of warm, um, warm product into the evaporator, that increased or into the, the cooler itself, that created a large load onto the evaporator. Well, your pressure goes up on the, um, when your, um, when your load goes up, your pressure goes up on the suction side of the system. Your suction pressure uh, transducer will sense that and will make adjustments. Every 20 seconds, we'll make adjustments on whether or not we should load the evaporator or, or I'm sorry, load the compressor or unload the compressor. All right? So in this case, we're, 
were um, were loaded at um, at four at uh, <clears throat> four seconds and un unloaded at 16 seconds. So I guess we would be considered at uh, what's that 25 percent, 20 percent, somewhere around there. Thinking off the top of my head, um, but that's how we follow the load with the digital scroll compressor. We also have digital um, semi-hermetic, like the 3D compressors. Uh, Tim Uderman ha gave a really good class yesterday or the other day in regards to um, uh, digital technology and stuff. And uh, I highly advise, um, you know, taking a look at that. And, um, and and if you have any questions on that, certainly get a hold of uh, either either our team, outside field team, or um, uh, yeah, some of our personnel inside. 